This is the Unstarving Musicians Podcast. The podcast features conversation for musicians of all types and genres, a curation of expertise intended to help all musicians be better at marketing, business, the creative process, and all the other things that empower us to do more of what we love, make music. This episode is powered by the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, How to Get Booked and Paid What You're Worth Over and Over Again, written by Roberto R. Hernandez. That's me, yours truly. Learn more about the book at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash book and on Amazon. Happy holiday greetings, my dear listener friends. This is Robonzo. My guest in this episode of the Unstarving Musicians podcast is Mark Winner, founder frontman of American Blues Roots Band, The Nighthawks. Mark and I were connected by a listener of the podcast who recently left me a voice message suggesting Mark would be a great guest. Thank you, Eddie. Mark came up as a young man when rock and roll truly was the devil's music, or that's what most adults at the time believed anyway. Rebellion was owning rock and roll records, which of course Mark did. As a very young man, Mark used to venture across D.C. to see the likes of Otis Redding, James Brown, and Marvin Gaye mentor Billy Stewart perform at the Howard Theater. He's performed and in many cases been friends with the Vaughn Brothers, Greg Allman, George Thorogood, Warren Hayes, Muddy Waters, B.B. King, and many others. He's kind of the real deal. His band, The Nighthawks, is the subject of a 2016 documentary called Nighthawks on the Blue Highway, which you can find on the Amazon They've released about 30 albums and have relentlessly toured over the decades since they started up in 1972. Yet, as Mark will confess, they never quite hit the big-time fame status that many of their peers realized. As you can imagine, Mark has lots of stories to tell. In the 50 minutes or so that we spoke, he shares a few good ones. And we managed to have a little how-did-you-do-that conversation around his ability to consistently reach new venues in the early days. His strategy still applies today. In a twist of irony, the Nighthawks will be performing at the 2018 Boquete Jazz and Blues Festival. It was this little twist that made the aforementioned listener think I should in- <laughs> that made the aforementioned listener think that I should interview Mark. Yes, that's right. Yep, the Nighthawks are coming to Panama. Please enjoy this fascinating conversation with Mark Wenner. Mark Wenner, welcome to the Unstarving Musicians podcast. Thank you, sir. I'm on the borderline of starving and unstarving. So. <laughs> Perfect timing, then. Thanks for uh, taking the call now while you're walking your pooch. I know you're walking uphill, so if uh, those of you listening to this, if you hear him huffing and puffing, as he mentioned to me before we started, uh, you'll know why. <laughs> yeah, but it's all hills where I live. There's hardly any flat ground, so I get my mountain work out here. Yeah, very good. Well, I wanted to start by asking you about the Boquete Jazz and Blues Festival and your acquaintance with Deanna Bogart, who is one of the talent organizers, I guess. I don't recall her exact title, but I know of her because of John Wolfe, the president of the Boquete Jazz and Blues Festival, and the Nighthawks, your band, will be there for the 2018 festival, which happens February 22nd through the 25th in Boquete, Panama. So, Please tell me how it came about, again, that you got acquainted with Deanna or she got in touch with you or whatever. I have known Deanna for probably 40 years, actually. She was in a wonderful band called Cowboy Jazz. There's some D.C. people, but the band was more or less based around Colorado for a long time. The way I, my best friend growing up, who is now deceased, Bill Clark, was their roadie. Somehow it came to when they were recording their first album, I'm assuming through Bill's influence, I got hired to play on a song called Santa Cruz Blues on their first album. That started a a long friendship with Deanna. She, of course, until pretty recently, was based in the D.C. area and is still a big hometown hero here, although she's now a Californian. Goodness gracious. We have kept in touch. Uh, We have shared stages in festivals and clubs, of course, on the those international or the legendary blues cruises, which I think is some of the people that are getting hired and stuff. It looks like she's sort of tapping into that very large talent pool of people who have been through the uh, cruises. Are you familiar with the legendary blues cruises? I am because I don't know if I told you when we very first met recently that I'm a drummer and I, for the past 17 years, I was performing in the South San Francisco Bay Area. But anyway, some friends of mine who were a little more plugged into the blues scene 
had been on it. I learned of it then. I think I'm just now learning, though, that Deanna has been part of that. And actually, I think when we spoke a few days ago, you and I briefly, that you told me that that's part of how you knew one another. So, but yeah, so tell me about it. How did you get involved in that? Let's back up a little more. Well, I can take you back. The guy who puts all this stuff, uh, puts these on, whose idea I think it was, is a guy named Roger Neighbor. And his first promotion was actually in Kansas. He's from Kansas City. And I think he was a Kansas City mailman who wanted to do a blues show. And we were coming through one of the first times we came to Kansas City. They had this great distribution out- outfit out there called uh, Penny Lane, a la the Beatles song. I don't think it still exists, but I don't really know because we were on a label that was distributed by them, and they did an incredible job promoting us. And one of the things they hooked us into was Roger put a show on in a a building I believe has since been torn down, but it was called Manor Hall, and it was an old jazz house in Kansas City, which, of course, is pretty legendary for Kansas City jazz, which is very rock and rolly. I mean, Big Joe Turner and stuff came out of that world. So we went for many years not getting on those cruises. And finally, Roger started inviting us here and there. I've been on the cruises as a solo, jumping around from band to band. And also with Tommy as a guest with Tommy Castro's Rhythm and Blues Review, which I think Tommy may be a partner in the cruises these days because he's always on it. And he'll do shows with his own band, and then his own band will also have, on every cruise, they do like three guests, and I've done that too. And there's also these incredible jams. Every night, one of the bands will host a jam out poolside on the back of the ships. I know I've played with Deanna on that several times. So I got a call from Deanna this past year asking me would I be interested. And of course, I said yes. Now, I've been south of the U.S. border on the water down there going into the Caribbean on these cruises, but I have never personally never been south of the border on the mainland, either to Central or South America. So this is an exciting thing for me. I started going to Europe in 84. I started going to and from Japan in 83. And I'm kind of done with both of those things. But it's going to be a big adventure to go to Panama. And this sounds like quite a thing. It's Plus, it's not just a blues festival, but a jazz festival. So there'll be guys that actually know how to really play. <laughs> uh, I mean, the blues. There's some pretty fancy players on these blues cruises and stuff. And there's guys, sophisticated musicians in the blues world. But you start talking about jazz, you're talking about guys that like went to school for music and stuff like that. My guitar player in the Nighthawks, he did a year up at Berkeley, so he's actually quite a musician and quite skilled in stuff other than blues and primitive rock and roll. But he tries not to let it show. <laughs> I'm sure that's handy. Um, by the way, you're located in Kensington, is that right? Kensington, Maryland is just on the north. If you look at the Washington, D.C., there's, of course, the what we call the Beltway, a circular highway that goes all the way around. If you look at that as a clock, I'm about 12 o'clock high outside the Beltway. John Wolfe, the organizer of the Jazz and Blues Festival, we talked a little bit about, I asked him, what do you say to guys that want to get on festival routes like this? And he had told me that they generally went after people that they, in so many words, that they had some relationship with and they knew to be, again, in so many words, reliable, low drama. <laughs> <laughs> right. The Blues Cruise, you probably had a relationship that evolved over time with Roger as well to get that eventual invitation and he clearly had a uh, trust in you to, to bring you on there? There's a little bit of weirdness that we won't really go too deep into, but a former guitar player of the Nighthawks, Jimmy Thackeray, was on like eight blues cruises year after year after year. And we sat on the sidelines wondering when our turn was going to come up. And it was a decade of cruises before we got picked. I like Roger. I think Roger does an incredible job of promoting the blues. And that's a great thing because... I don't think it's in danger of disappearing, but people who promote it and and make sure it gets heard and stuff, that's a great thing. And Roger is certainly one of the top guys in doing that. So I do feel privileged in that I have been chosen. Not enough for my taste, but (laughs) you hear that, Roger? uh, uh, 
we'll make sure he gets uh, apprised of the episode. There you go. <laughs> well, you made me think of something I wanted to ask about at some point, and I'll just jump into it. It sort of seems like a good segue, and hopefully it's an okay one for you. But I was doing a little reading that one of your former guitarists went on to play for the Almond Brothers, the Dead, and Government Mule. Uh, that was Warren Haynes, right? Yeah, well, Warren did a month with us, so we get to claim him, but it wasn't a real, <laughs> obviously not the high point in his career. We were working with another celeb, Jimmy Hall, back in the late 80s, and we were bouncing around different guitar players, and we finally got Jimmy Knowles in that band for a couple of years, so it was Jimmy Hall and Jimmy Knowles. But during the early part of our relationship with Jimmy Hall, we were kind of bouncing around from guitar player to guitar player. I didn't know Warren, but Jimmy did. Warren was working with Dickie Betts at the time in Great Southern. And Jimmy said, well, we can get this guy, Warren Haynes, at least for this tour, this couple weeks, month, whatever it was. And, of course, as it was coming to an end, I said to Warren, this job could be yours. <laughs> He's a sweetheart of a guy. I mean, just an, there's not just his incredible musical skills, but the fact that he's a great guy and everybody who likes him has led to his all the success of his. He thanked me, but he was committed to working with Dickie Betts at that time. I think I think it was still Great Southern, Dickie Betts' uh, solo band. They were going to write all this stuff together, blah, blah, blah. And he said, well, thanks, but I can't. So uh, we had another guy for another month, and then we got Jimmy Knowles for a couple of years. The first stand-ins was a guy named Stuart Smith who went on to play with the Eagles for a couple of years. He's just kind of out of that now that the Eagles are touring without but Stewart's also out, but he's on that big Eagles live video. And he all Stewart has other interactions with the band. He produced two of the band's best studio albums about a decade apart. Uh, Hard Living, which was Thackeray's last studio album in the band, and is probably the best studio album or one of the best studio albums of the first version of the band with Jimmy Thackeray. And then he did an album called Pain in Paradise in the early mid-90s, I guess it was. That's a, quite a piece of work. And he also played in a band that I did a solo album with called Switchblade, which was kind of a punkabilly, rockabilly DC band that I did a, my first solo album with. But yeah, Warren, uh, what a treat, you know. He's done so much since then. It's just amazing. Not just the Almond Brothers, but these, some of these last Waltz tributes he's involved with. And Government Mule is my least favorite part of Warren's stuff. I mean, he can do a lot of different stuff. And it's funny, like, I think the greatest book in American literature ever written was Moby Dick. But the worst book ever written was Pierre that Herman Melville wrote right after he finished Moby Dick. And it's sort of like he saved up all the bad stuff and put it in the second book, which I've never actually been able to read. My wife actually wrote a paper on it. So I guess she managed to get through it. But that's how I feel about Government Mule and Warren. You know, <laughs> I've seen a band on TV called the Warren Haynes Band, which I've seen my buddy, local D.C. guy, Ron Holloway, the sax player, playing in. And it's phenomenal. So he's done a lot of great stuff. And proud to say, if I bumped into him on the street, he'd know who I was and be happy to see me. So we did run into each other once at a rest area on the New York Thruway. That's actually the last time I saw him in person. And it was just so funny. I was walking out. He was walking in. And we had a great big smile and a big hug. And he had to go pee and I had to go leave. So it was a pretty brief encounter. But obviously, there's still some good feeling there. It looks like you guys have also crossed paths with, worked with, sort of been peers with a number of people. And the ones that caught my eye since we first spoke were George Thorogood, Fabulous Thunderbirds, and, oh my goodness. Greg Allman. Thank you. Buddy Waters. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Greg Allman is who I was searching for. I even had read, tell me if this is true, that Greg Allman had said he was going to join your band at one point in time. <laughs> That's what he told, it's in Rolling Stone magazine in print. He said, Greg Allman to join Nighthawks question mark, I think was the title of the article. He told him he was joining the Nighthawks. I, mean, I don't even know if I offered him the job, but I thought we were backing him up. But It was an interesting period in his life. Uh, he had just left Cher. He had just left California. He had just moved back to Georgia. We had a mutual friend, a guy named Twiggs Linden. Now, if you're familiar, I'm sure, with for the first Allman Brothers Live at the Fillmore double album, 
and there's black and white pictures of the band and the crew sitting on all the road cases. And on the back there, there's just a little square with a picture of a guy with a beard and a cowboy hat who's not in those pictures, but he was actually in jail at the time. That was Twiggs. He was the road manager. And he is a Southern music icon that nobody has really written a book about. But Twiggs was in jail for trying to stab a promoter that was trying to not pay the Allman Brothers. I think had, you know, was physically attacking Twiggs. And I think, believe it was self-defense, but whatever. He was not available for the photograph at the time. Well, hopefully he fared well after a brief stint, I hope, in prison. Yes. And he, of course, was out. A quick rundown on Twiggs. He goes back to working with Phil Walden. He road managed Little Richard when Walden was managing Little Richard. And then he went on to road manage Otis Redding. And then he did the Almond Brothers. And then he did the Dixie Dregs. So he was like a walking encyclopedia of the evolution of Southern rock and roll in three decades. Really three full Macon-based amazing purveyors of American music. Little Richard being, you know, the 50s rock and roll and Otis being the 60s soul music and then the Allman Brothers being the 70s, whatever the hell they were playing. And the dregs was the 80s kind of, oh, very sophisticated art rock and roll or whatever. I don't, I don't know what you would quite call what they were up to. But we had an affiliation with them, of course, through Twigs. But Twigs was a big Nighthawks fan. I mean, Greg had sort of gotten off the plane almost. This is a bit of an exaggeration. And Twiggs threw him in a VW and drove him all the way over to Alabama, about a two-hour drive or something, because we were playing there. The word was out that he was coming. It was like the second coming of Jesus. I mean, it was phenomenal. And there's an iconographic thing about the long, blonde-haired, southern, pretty boy. It's a rock and roll thing. You look at Wayne Cochran. You look at the wrestler, Ric Flair, there's this thing of these, a great book called The Gospel Singer. And it's this image of this guy with really long, very light blonde hair. It's close to Jesus in the way Southerners think of this image. And Greg totally carried that. And the venue itself, the uh, stage was just, if you came in the door, the stage was to the right. But you came in the door, you were looking at the room. So the room was looking at the door. Greg's a tall guy. If you were even in the back of the room, you could see the front door. You could see that the entrance was one of those phenomena. That blonde hair came in through that door. The whole place, like, I had to change their drawers. It was just so incredible. Now, he got pretty drunk that night. He got up on stage, and we did not have a keyboard. His guitar plan was okay, but it wasn't what you really wanted from one of the almond, the real almond brothers. So... I wasn't really happy with what what, he was kind of staggering around on stage a little bit. And we said to Twigs, I said, sure, the guy's famous, sure, the guy's great, but we don't need a drunk rock star staggering around on our stage. We're not that interested. Twigs took him back to Georgia and put him into rehab and then brought him up to D.C. sober. And we had a B3 on stage, and it was a phenomenal night. And so that went on. He would just show up. It was a kind of bizarre relationship. He would just show up when he wanted to show up. We never quite knew if he was coming or not. Even the one time we told people he was coming, he didn't show up. (laughs) I got three different calls. Man, I missed my plane. And a half an hour, man, I missed another plane. I mean, what the hell? What are you doing? And that was in the Philadelphia area. That's a good story, too. He didn't show up. The place was packed. And people were really kind of pissed off because he wasn't there. And we were kind of kicking ass. And then Clarence Clements showed up and sat in and sort of helped us through the night. But we've had many a brush with celebrities that have ultimately done not that much for us. Uh, but it's still cool to talk about. But Greg was a really special guy. And he and I had a lovely relationship. He's in the motorcycles as I was, as I am. And one of the last things he said to me, we had this encounter that he mistakenly in his one book, My Cross the Bear, or whatever it is, his descriptions of his encounters with me are there's like a decade apart he's gotten mixed up. But he remembers he showed up we were playing in at Daytona at Bike Week. And he's of course from Florida in that area. And he shows up he's actually the place is slammed and he's first in line and the doorman's not letting him in and I can see him outside. I said, the doorman, I said, you got to let this guy in. That's fucking Greg Allman. And I said, oh, okay. 
So he comes in, and we're getting getting ready to play. So I just got him up right on stage. And so the first song is Key to the Highway with Greg Allman playing with us. And then he's got to go. But the only thing he really said to me that day was, man, y'all see my new chopper. (laughs) (laughs) Kind of the last words that passed between us directly. He left a very funny message on my phone once where he said he was in San Diego right by the San Francisco Bay Bridge. Oh, uh, no. <laughs> wondering about his, his sense of uh, geography was probably a little muted. That's funny. I was meaning to ask you, I had seen on your Facebook page a sweet-looking Chevy of some sort, and I saw a lot of motorcycles. So how long have you been collecting, and what are you into? Well, I'm into older American motorcycles. That's a 50 Chevy that I actually bought from Paul Barrere of Little Feet. I ran a 48 Chevy for about 20 years, and he had had all the things done to, to his that I always had wanted to do to mine. He offered to sell it to me, and I pounced on it. But I'm into the uh, Indians and Harleys, mainly from the 30s, 40s, and 50s, although I've got a 1925 Indian Scout. It's a bit of a hot rod. It's kind of the two-wheeled equivalent of a 20s Model T with a 48 Mercury flathead motor in it. The motor is barely recognizable from what it was. And, of course, it's a bright red with chrome wheels and all that kind of stuff. doesn't quite look like what they looked like in 1925. But I do have in my collection one of 75 Crockers ever made. Uh, Crocker was a motorcycle made in, in Los Angeles from 1936 to 1942. Never quite got off the ground and then had to shut down and go into war production and never revived itself. So the rarity in itself makes it very valuable. It was like the Hayabusa of its day. It was just in 1930, the late 30s. Well, he advertised if a Harley or a stock Harley or Indian beat you on the street, he'd give you your money back. These were the badass super bikes of the late 30s. It's still, mine's been running for less than a year now. It's pretty impressive what it is. I'm still wrestling with some adjustments and stuff on the clutch, but I think the guy who put the clutch together left out a clutch plate is my current theory. Uh Uh-oh. I saw a picture of the Crocker on your Facebook page, too, and I was like, wow, I've never seen one. It's pretty, ain't it? It is. It's very cool. Yeah, buddy. (laughs) Very cool. Hey, so for people that want to know, and we've talked a little about some of the history of the band and your celebrity run-ins, you guys have a relatively new documentary, Night Hawks on the Blue Highway? Right. Well, we don't have it, but it, somebody made it. I like to make that distinction. It's, it's not a movie we made. It's a movie someone made about us. And we were very cooperative, of course. But yes, and it covers two of the coolest things. And of course, there's some nice coverage of our relationship with Greg Allman, which I thought was a little excessive until now that he's died. I'm glad it's there. There's some pluses and minuses about our relationship with Greg because I didn't want to want to be known as the band that once backed up Greg Allman, which we've been advertised as once or twice. Like, no, that's not my claim to fame, but I'll take it if I have to. That's one time in Ocean City, Maryland, there were two bands playing and both promoters claiming to have Greg Allman's backup band. I forget who the other band was, but they had backed him up somewhere. So it was like weird. It was very weird. Even 20 years later, we were advertised that way once. I had to jump in the guy's shit. You know, like, what do you mean? That's what we are. Once backed up Greg Allman. Okay. That's too funny. And how did the documentary come about? The guy did a documentary about a local character here in D.C., uh, Joe Lee, who's had a record store and been a promoter and been involved in the music scene for a long time. And I was interviewed for that. As I was being interviewed, I guess the light came on and Michael said, say, yeah, I could do a documentary about these guys. He's a writer and a filmmaker. He's written like four books about Johnny Cash. He's one of the world's experts, I guess, on Johnny Cash at this point. And he's got several films under his belt. The film got a pretty good response at some film festivals. And we're actually just running out of copies for sale. He didn't think people would want to be buying it that much. I sell it pretty regularly. It's an interesting film. My favorite stuff in it is it covers our relationship with Muddy Waters pretty nicely, which is still and will always be kind of one of the number one things in my career. 
I mean, as a blues harmonica player, all the greats, starting with Little Walter, Big Walter, Junior Wells, and James Cotton, George Smith, Mojo Buford, all did, and Paul Osher and Jerry Portnoy, all did their time as Muddy's harp player. And I've got a couple of nights in there where I did that, and many a night where I got to sit in and do that. So that's like being the vice president of the United States or something. It's the number two slot that's imaginable. You can't be muddy, and you wouldn't want to be as a harp player. You're not trying to be muddy, but to play harp with Muddy Waters is kind of the peak of what one can do, and I was very lucky. I mean, I worked very hard at getting to a point where I had that kind of relationship with him, but it's nicely covered in the documentary. An awful lot got left out, but it's 74 minutes to try to describe 45 years. So. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure there's a ton. And I'm curious, you said you regularly sell copies. I'm curious about the relationship, if any, with the band or you on a business front for the documentary. Is there any, or, or are they just like, we'd love to feature you in this here, the benefits you guys are going to get known, and oh, by the way, you can sell copies and mark them up however you want. That's pretty much it. I mean, it's we're pretty friendly with the guy. I mean, he sort of kind of lived with us for a couple of years, traveled with us, set up situations where we did stuff. We did not make the movie. We just dug into the vaults and dug out every old picture and video and anything else we could come up with that, that he could use. Again, and I, I always correct people quickly that it's not what we made and it's not the movie I would have made, but... It certainly takes care of a certain amount of business. It does leave out 20 plus years. It covers the first 10 very nicely, and it covers the last 10 very, very nicely, which are both sort of our most visible. But there was some pretty cool stuff went on in the middle, including Warren Haynes and Jimmy Hall and Jimmy Knowles and some of that other stuff is just a list at the end. And there was actually some pretty cool little bit of footage of Jimmy Hall and Jimmy Knowles from a festival. But we're just whomping. I mean, we are really kicking ass. It could have been a minute of that and a minute of one of the other versions of the band when they left and we got these two young, really young guys who are really authentic. And there's some really neat, for 30 seconds, a minute, I would have included. But I said, it's not my movie, so... Yeah. You've mentioned the time span a couple of times here, that the time span in which the band has been playing together. And I was looking at your current tour schedule. It looks very busy. And then in reading in the early history, it looked like you wanted to be a career musician from the outset. You guys look like you have a rather grueling tour schedule. Well, nothing like it used to be, though. I mean, if you looked at what we did from 76 to 86, that was 300 days a year. We played in 49 states and 10 different countries. And we kind of came home, did the laundry and left again. And that's nothing like, I mean, our schedule looks busy, but there's a lot of stuff we're driving home from. I mean, this Friday, I drive two hours, play a show, and drive home. There's a lot more of that, a lot less of getting in the van and coming back six weeks later. I think the first time we did a seven-week run, we decided it was too complicated to not be home when the bills came up once a month. We kind of figured... There wasn't really any place we couldn't get to and get back in between three and four weeks. Even driving to and from California can be done in three weeks. If you don't work your way out and work your way back, you just deadhead out there, be out there for a couple of three weeks, and then deadhead back. We once did Hermosa Beach to my house in 49 hours, I think. <laughs> That's a little insane, and we were much, much younger, but... I mean, it just, we whacked a whole bunch of sections. I haven't been to the northwest of the U.S. in 35. The last tour I did it, there was an 86 one. So that's 30 some years ago. And Texas fell off the map like 20 some years ago. It's just, I'm going to Texas myself for a James Cotton tribute, but I'm going to fly down there and be there like a day and a half. You got to where, well, we can handle it. We can get out to the Midwest once a year. We can go to Florida twice a year and up to upstate New York twice a year. I mean, that's enough. <laughs> the irony is this last album we did just got phenomenal reviews everywhere and got airplay everywhere. And if I was 20, I wouldn't be home right now. I'd be on a van on my way to Vancouver or something like that because that's kind of what that's all about. But I even got a, 
I don't know, just a hustle email from some guy in Europe that he could put together these tours and radio promos and this and that. And I wrote back and said, you know, like you're only like 40 years too late, pal. <laughs> I'm not doing it. That latest album is all you got to do. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, it's done extremely well out there. So. Well, I can't wait to listen to it. I, For those of you listening, I just got introduced to uh, the Nighthawks a little earlier this week by way of a podcast listener who was kind enough to leave me a voice message. And he found out about the podcast from an email that he received from a recent guest, David Barrett. Anyway, I was listening to one of your live albums. It's the one that garnered you the Blues Music Award in 2011, I think. Oh, yeah. The acoustic one. Last Train to Bluesville. Yeah, great album. I'm really looking forward to hearing all you got to do. It does bring me to another question I wanted to ask you. I'm kind of recently curious because of some of my other guests about um, labels and distribution. So it looks like you guys are on a new label, Eller Soul Records, for this one. Is that the first one they've done with you? No, it's the third. Okay. And when we were involved in a fourth album, a Reverend Billy Wirtz is a kind of a comedian Kind of pseudo preacher for the one that is the Church of Polyester or something. <laughs> He's a, a pretty irreverent character. And uh, right in the middle of recording, all you got to do, he kind of blasted in. We did some studio stuff. Then we had an audience come in, did a live evening show with him. And then he left and we went back to work on our own album again, which didn't come out for quite a bit after. They, his came out really quickly. Uh, we did some hellacious playing on it, though. That's a version of Jerry Lewis's Breathless on there that I'm very proud of. It's just in terms of the sound, and the, it rocks. It seriously rocks. So. But Eller Soul's been around. Now, we almost went with Eller Soul before we went with uh, Severn, an album called Damn Good Time, which is absolutely one of our great albums, too, I think. I'm very proud of that. We were ready to do another album, and Severn wasn't. They needed. There were various reasons for delay. So I just said, well, I don't want to wait it much longer. So I got in touch with Eller Soul, who'd been vying against Severn to get us previously. And even the Severn relationship was something that got started 30 years ago when David Earl first started his company. And instead, I mistakenly, with 30 years uh, hindsight, mistakenly went with an already established German label, Roof, R-U-F, that didn't really work out for us at all. It looked very promising, and Severn was just getting started. And I said, well, I should go with something more established rather than bet on this kid that's just starting a label. And that was a mistake. <laughs> well, what can I say? <laughs> and the kid, the label that you're talking about there that you did not go with this roof? or No, it's Severn, S-E-V-E-R. And that's a Severn River in Annapolis is what it's named for. Roof is based out of Germany. He nurtured Anna Popovich. I don't think she's still with him, but she's one of the people that came out of his corral. He likes attractive women blues players, and we definitely didn't qualify. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, who doesn't like attractive women blues players? <laughs> well, yeah, you know. <laughs> well, thanks for sharing the story of the change. Those are kind of the little things I'm curious about. You know, I had an an artist on recently who's different genres, and he's kind of been pigeonholed in the power pop genre, but He's had a 20, 30 plus year career and he, part of his career is actually working with his label as part of the production team. But we were, he and I and another more recent guest, a younger guy who's kind of a newcomer to professional music. He's in the metal genre, completely different here, but they've used labels and he was talking about the benefit of having a label in metal anyway for being able to get along on festivals and he was speculating on the future of labels and what they might look like and I'm just kind of curious since you've been working with them for as many years as you have can you tell me what changes you would anticipate might happening or what changes you've seen oh well I've run the gamut I have had big labels little labels good labels bad labels my own labels other people's labels who just let me use their name and basically I did everything for it is changing. I mean, you can just record something on your computer in your living room and put it out there on the Internet anymore. I mean, labels have become, in some ways, much less important to the distribution of music. They still exist, and they still seem to have their function. My relationship with labels, I said some, I've paid for absolutely everything except the use of someone's label's name ordered the CDs from the pressing plant and they all come to my house and 
I've had 1,500 CDs stacked up in boxes all over my house. And then I've worked with Mercury for a horrible year (laughs) where (laughs) every bad thing that could happen to you on a major label happened to us. Uh, I guess they're going to continue to exist, but the kids have proved it. I had a very good friend who's been in the music business, but not a player. And some of his sons have played. And when one of his sons was 16, I went to see them play. They're from California. I'm in D.C., that's 3,000 miles apart. They were playing across the river in Virginia in what turned out to be just a house, a basement of a rental house. When I asked, I thought it was going to be a church or some community center or something. And I was looking for the address, and I stopped and asked a guy mowing his lawn, and he acted like I was the invading enemy or something. Like, oh, that house. Oh, oh, it's down there, you know. These basically punk bands were playing. There'd be like eight bands in a show. Everybody does like 25 minutes. And there were a whole bunch of these, you know, hipster little kids. And I felt like the chaperone or the scoutmaster or something. These kids showed up. They were somebody's mom's minivan with a U-Haul trailer. The U-Haul trailer had sleeping bags and skateboards on top of the gear. They had played every night from L.A. to D.C., and they had people there waiting, all excited. Do you have copies of your new CD? We have the old one. How, now, these kids in Virginia and Maryland knew about this band of 16-year-olds from L.A. I mean, obviously, they didn't weren't being played on MTV or anything. I mean, this was eye-opening to me to see this complete circuitry, this complete network that was going on totally external to anything I was aware of in any industry that I was aware of. I was pretty blown away by that. This was in the last 20 years, I'm guessing. But then again, when I was first starting out and looking at, well, how do I have a blues band or a roots band that's able to put out music and tour and do this stuff? Because I never expected for there to be the degree of crossover that somebody like Thurgood or the Thunderbirds were able to pull off. I was working on that myself and never could pull it off myself. And people I was associated with and had helped along myself were able to break through somehow. It seems like every seven years, somebody kind of bluesy breaks through into the mainstream. Thurgood and then Stevie Ray and then the Thunderbirds and then Robert Cray, all of whom opened for the Nighthawks before they got famous. <laughs> we were figuring maybe we should open for ourselves or something at one point. <laughs> yeah, you're a good luck charm for others. Yeah, but each of those characters had something that we didn't quite have tightened down and able to pull off either a song or a look or both. But in 1972, when I was starting out here in D.C., D.C. was the bluegrass center of the universe. I don't know if you are aware of that at all, but... Oh, no. It's because of where we're located in relation to the Appalachian Mountains and where that music came from. And the fact that D.C., if no one really seems to understand internationally, is a factory town. And it's a town that has drawn whole last century when there was a depression or a war or anything else. There were jobs in D.C. And people came from Pennsylvania and West Virginia and Virginia, North and South Carolina and Maryland. And they came here, and they had jobs, and they brought their music with them. Not only, you know, a great deal of fantastic African-American music, but a great deal of hillbilly music. And the biggest stars in bluegrass music were working out of D.C. in the D.C. area, were recording on labels based out of the D.C. area, were getting, they were selling records, they were getting airplay on bluegrass shows on college radio or whatever, I was looking at this, and I lived in the neighborhood with the seldom scene, and the country gentlemen were playing. There was a joint up the street from us. The country gentlemen, the seldom seen, people like that were playing on a regular basis. And these are bluegrass bands? Major star, bluegrass stars. I mean, the country gentlemen, the seldom seen, S-C-E-N-E, in the 60s and 70s and 80s ruled the world. I mean, of course, Ralph Stanley and Bill Monroe still live down in Southern Virginia, but believe me, they came up there a good bit. And there were bluegrass festivals all around this area. Who was the other band with Door Gentlemen in? The Country Gentlemen. 
And there's a crossover that the um, mandolin player played in both the bands I mentioned, John Duffy. But I started trying to figure out, well, I can maybe develop my own little world like this. And interestingly enough, as we started touring, okay, you got to understand that Muddy Waters in the mid to late 70s was touring. He had a band, mostly Chicago guys, but now there was a couple of younger white guys in the band. So everywhere they would go, the local blues band would open for them, right? Us here, the Thunderbirds in Texas, room full of blues up in Boston. Now, Bob Margoland, who was the guy you see in the last waltz playing with Muddy, who looks a little Bob Dylan-like, who I still do work with, he was very accessible. Jerry Port, the harp player, was a little hard to get, but Margolin was very accessible, easy to talk to. Even, not even an opener, but just watching a show, you could probably talk to Bob. Bob would go out and jam with local bands. Bob would carry cassettes back and forth. The first time I heard the Thunderbirds was on a cassette player driving to Charlottesville, Virginia with Bob Margolin to open a show for Muddy Waters. And I'm listening to Kim Wilson and the Thunderbirds going, holy Christmas, who are these guys? Well, within a year, I was able to book the Thunderbirds in D.C. I had a great situation here where I could not only bring in Chicago guys, but the bands like the Thunderbirds who were out there playing this kind of music. We had an interactive circuit. So I developed a circuit that took me to and from Boston and to and from Atlanta. Well, going to Boston, there was a whole interworld of Boston bands that were influenced by the Chicago bands who were traveling back and forth Chicago to Boston that developed a circuit across New York State, Syracuse, Rochester, Buffalo, Albany. They're clubs where blues bands could play. So once I got to Boston and once I got related to Muddy Waters, I could plug in and go from Boston across I-90 all the way to Chicago, ultimately. Now, there were bands that were in Austin, Texas, that were traveling to and from Atlanta. Omar and Howlers, Marsha Ball, Delbert McClinton, and ultimately the Thunderbirds and Stevie Ray going to and from Atlanta. Well, I started encountering them in Atlanta. So in 76, I started going up and down. In 78, I was able to go out to Chicago, to Denver, down to Austin, back through New Orleans, back home. And that was 1978, 1980. I was able to go to Seattle, to San Diego, back home. But the Seattle to San Diego was with opening for Muddy Waters the whole way. Mark, how were you nurturing that circuit? Or how did it develop such that you're able to sort of extend the touring circuit? Or how did all the relationships come together? Well, I was aggressively contacting people. Once I, I got a phone number for the Thunder, I knew the Thunderbirds were going from Austin to Boston stay in a week or two like we would, and then they'd go all the way back home. Well, I got a phone number for Jimmy Vaughn. I said, dude, on your way to Boston, I can get you 500 bucks on a Monday. Now, they were making 500 bucks for a week in Boston. So this was pretty attractive. And then the next time he was coming through D.C., I mean, just going to Boston, they stopped and played here and just blew everybody away. Same thing with Thorogood. No one had ever heard of Thorogood. I actually met him in Boston, but I've been trying to find him for a couple of months because we were overlapping in Baltimore. He's an hour north of Baltimore. I'm an hour south of Baltimore. People were saying, oh, there's a guy that comes in here and plays this slide guitar stuff like you guys do, these Elmore James songs, Madison Blues and Dust My Broom. They said, for the guy from Delaware is playing this music? I don't believe it. <laughs> Guy walked up to me outside the speakeasy in Cambridge, Mass. and said, I'm George Thurgood. I've been wanting to meet you. I said, well, I've been wanting to meet you, too. <laughs> That's great. By the way, I heard a, I don't know if it interests you. You sort of lived it. But for those listening, I heard a great interview with Jimmy Vaughn on the Ooh. WTF podcast, which is a very, very, very popular podcast. Well done. And it was actually it was a holiday sort of episode before Thanksgiving, I believe. So they had half of it was Jimmy Vaughn. And the other half of it was Casper Collin and Benny Maupin, a jazz player and a documentary maker. Yeah, very cool, though. If you like, I can certainly send you a link to that one. But those of you listening, it uh, was pretty cool. We're sitting here talking about Jimmy Vaughn, so it might be fun. Yeah, Jimmy Vaughn may be one of the best guitar players to play with a harp ever. I got to sit in with him last year 
or this year, I guess it was. This year is almost over. <laughs> it's still this year, though. He played in town, and I showed up. He said, you got a harp with you? I said, of course. So I got up and played harp, and me and Luann sang uh, some Jimmy Reed songs together. And it, it just a joy, you know, to still maintain a friend, even though I haven't talked to him in 10 years, but he knows who I am if I walk in a room. And we also share that car thing, that old car thing. When we met, I had a 48 Chevy because I was born in 48. He had a 51 Chevy because he was born in 51. So he had a better budget to build his, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They shot as they shot past us and got hit records in MTV. But. Sure. He sounds like such a nice guy. I kind of underappreciated him during his earlier days. I recall I had seen the Thunderbirds open for the Rolling Stones, and then I went to see Stevie Ray play once in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, and Jimmy came out and played a few songs with them. And I knew who he was, and I knew he recognized he's great. And then right before his brother died, they did the... Family Affair. Yeah, the Family Affair, which is great. But anyway, listening to him recently on that podcast, it was very fun. It's like, okay, I need to dig into his music clearly. Yeah, he's not a flash guy. He's not a show-off. He's subtle. He's simple. For every 50 notes that Stevie played, uh, Jimmy will play two. Yeah, they were very different, weren't they? Yep. Very different in that way. Yeah, he's a very great musician, though. I wanted to ask you a little bit about growing up or ask if you could share a story growing up in Chevy Chase, Maryland. And please tell me I got that right, that that is where you grew up. Yes, sir. The closest suburb to uh, D.C. We crossed the district line, and it was about a mile to my house from the northwest uh, corner of Washington, D.C., to where it was a 15-minute walk to get on a D.C. bus that would take you anywhere in Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. had phenomenal radio in the 50s, and then even more phenomenal black radio in the 60s. Again, D.C. being this incredible music town, D.C. should have been Memphis. If we'd had a Stax and a Sun, there was the music here to create that roots music thing. We had the usual sleazeball local record companies that just were so exploitive that nothing was like that was really ever going to happen. But we had early on the mixing of hillbilly and blues and rhythm and blues in the 50s, we had stations that were playing everything all together. It's like in 58 and 59, things started getting sorted out and divided. And people like Dick Clark started creating fake rock and roll that wasn't these crazed hillbillies that came out of Memphis that weren't quite safe. Okay, I was a paranoid little suburban kid. But the way I looked at it, by 1959, Elvis was in the Army. Jerry Lee Lewis had been banned and was playing country music. Little Richard had gone back to the church. Ray Charles was in jail for heroin. Buddy Holly was dead. Eddie Crocken was dead. Gene Vincent was crippled. All this stuff had been wiped away, and we were being presented with Fabian and Frankie Avalon. I knew that something was wrong. It looked like a plot. I mean, older people hated rock and roll and would get really crazed about yelling about it. I had teachers that would yell about rock and roll for a whole period. So it was part of the whole rebellious rebel without a cause thing was to have rock and roll records and not have to, and certain people you didn't tell about it. At that point, as the radio started changing dramatically for me in the stations I listened to, I became aware that there were three African-American run stations in Washington, D.C., and at least one out of Baltimore and one out of Annapolis that I could occasionally get. And at a certain point after spending most of eighth grade listening to a Ray Charles album, a little bit to a Gary U.S. Bonds album, somebody lent me James Brown Live at the Apollo, first volume one. And I spent my ninth grade listening to that. Now, the Apollo, of course, is on the, the black circuit of theaters like the Royal in Baltimore and the Regal in Chicago, we had the Howard Theater. Now, I could tell my parents I was going to the movies in Bethesda and walk the other way and get on a bus and transfer once at 7th Street, Georgia Avenue, and get off at 7th and T on a Saturday afternoon at 2 o'clock and go see a show at the Howard Theater. There was not quite as wild as the show on Saturday night, but it was the same show, and it was the bands that were on the black theater circuit, not quite the chitlin' circuit, but 
I saw James Brown and Wilson Pickett and Otis Redding, and I only saw a few blues guys. I saw Slim Harpo there, but Muddy Waters and B.B. King weren't playing there at that point. They had played there in earlier times, but this was being the early 60s. Let's see, I turned 10 and 58, so by 61, 62, we were adventurous little greaser boys. I mean, by the time we changed buses on Georgia Avenue, we were the only white people. And they, this was pre-assassination uh, of Martin Luther King. They thought we were the cutest little boys ever, little greaser boys coming to see Otis Redding or something. And we were always treated very nicely. And So being from Chevy Chase and all the people go, oh, how can a little white boy from Chevy Chase know so much about this music? Well, it was just, it was there. What else am I going to listen to? Perry Como? <laughs> <laughs> and was that, I'm sorry to backtrack, was that in Bethesda where you were checking out all this music? This was in D.C. It's 7th and T Street, Washington, D.C., um, the heart of the ghetto, the Howard Theater, where, around where Howard University is. And now it's a very gentrified neighborhood, but for many years, you'd be taking your life in your hands going down there. And it changed dramatically when between the right after Martin Luther King got assassinated and D.C. burnt down. That whole stretch of D.C. got burned and rioted. And then, of course, you had the, the anti-Vietnam protests and demonstrations. And a lot of those areas were pretty harsh for a long time. Now, the yuppies have invaded and they've run the black people out to Prince George's County and gentrified and now what used to be empty townhouses and row houses are now million dollar plus yuppie land but in the early 60s it wasn't pretty but it wasn't crazy my brother's a little bit younger than me and he started going down there they'd go down at night in a group of eight guys kind of jock guys and they'd run into trouble people would challenge them they'd get into fights and stuff but we were like two and three i even went by myself and I saw Otis Redding, I was the only white person in the place. It was right when he covered Satisfaction. And he came out open with Satisfaction. I looked around and said, I bet I'm the only one in this place that knows this is a Rolling Stones song. <laughs> no one else, I'm sure, had a clue what was happening there. And to me, that was some of the great magic of the, some of that period. And it was the Rolling Stones did Otis Redding song on their first album. Here's Otis Redding doing a Rolling Stones song just a couple of years later. That was some pretty magical stuff. And that's what really made Memphis magical at the time. You know, you had guys like uh, Steve Cropper and Duck Dunn recording on every great black record that came out of Memphis and kids like Charlie Musselwhite learning from Will Shade and moving up to Chicago, knowing how to play harp like Big Walter. The music has been the, one of the things that's helped to break down some of these stupid barriers and walls. Yeah, there was something that you had been quoted in either a Washington Post or a publication called The Breeze when asked about what it was you enjoyed most about blues and the roots music that you've been around for so long. And you made mention that it's just, at the time anyway, that it was really wonderful that you could go around the world and meet people for the first time in this particular genre and be able to connect with them, jam with them. And music has a lovely way of breaking down walls, doesn't it? Yes, sir. Where the nighthawks.com, I assume that's the best place for people to find out about the band online. Yep. And then on to the Facebook pages as well. And that's at the Nighthawks. And then you have Mark Weiner. Mark Weiner, W-E-N-N-E-R, for those of you listening, and I'll have all this in the show notes. I see that you guys have the majority, if not all, of your music on iTunes. I saw a little bit on CD Baby, and you can, of course, check it out on thenighthawks.com. Is there anything you would like to ask of my listening audience or anything you'd love for them to do or know about before we wrap it up? Well, just keep listening to this music because it's where all the rest of the stuff comes from at least as far as American music goes, and American music being awfully influential in the rest of the world, it's this magic interaction that started over a century ago between real rootsy hillbilly music and African-American music. And this weird stuff called rock and roll was created. And you people argue about, well, was Louis Jordan the first rock and roll guy? Was Ike Turner the first rock and roll record with... Rocket 88, whatever. You can go back to the 20s. 
I mean, one of the magic things about the first Jimmy Rogers was he was bringing blues elements into country music, which everybody gives Elvis credit for, you know, 40 years later. But it's the beauty of the basis of American music. So keep on listening to it. Indeed. Thank you very much for that. And I hope to see you at the Boquete Jazz and Blues Festival. And I'm so happy that we were introduced by your good friend. Thanks a lot for your time. This was a lot of fun. Thank you, Ed Crowley. I hope you're listening. (laughs) I bet he will. All right. Thanks, Mark. We'll talk again soon. Thank you, sir. Hey, this is Robonzo. Thanks so much for listening. If you enjoyed this podcast, please subscribe on iTunes, Stitcher, or Google Play Music. If you liked this podcast, please leave a review. This episode was sponsored by the Unstarving Musician's Guide to Getting Paid Gigs, How to Get Booked and Paid What You're Worth Over and Over Again, available on Amazon and in audio format as the Unstarving Musician's Guide podcast. You can also learn more about the book and companion podcast at unstarvingmusician.com forward slash book. Are you a gigging musician, recording artist, songwriter, or touring professional, perhaps struggling to get your music out to the world? Struggling to get the gigs you want? Pop over to unstarvingmusician.com and sign up for my email list. I'll send you occasional emails about upcoming episodes, expert tips and advice, music, musician resources, and anything else I come across that might make your journey better and brighter. The Unstarving Musicians podcast is edited by Juan Perez. Are you a podcaster? Would you like 20% off on editing of your first four episodes? Visit the show notes for this episode for a link to Juan's freelance profile or unstarvingmusician.com forward slash resources and mention you heard about this offer through the Unstarving Musicians podcast. With much gratitude, peace, love, and more cowbell.